So before I introduce Matthew Shepard, who is our presenter from the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, um, I wanted to, uh, you know what, so if you've been with us from the beginning, you know that we started talking about bee botany in this series. We had some um, great elements of bee uh, biology. Uh, we talked about all the ways that you can contribute as a community scientist, um, whether it's through photography or collecting data. Uh, Mary Gardner last month did a great overview of, of community science projects and how those are so important. And I wanted today's topic uh, to kind of pull us all together. Um, so your importance as a community scientist, uh, collecting that data, making those observations is really important. And how can you also pivot that interest um, in community scientists, in community science um, to be an advocate for pollinators? And so I turn to, to Matthew Shepard to, um, to give us an overview of some of the ways that people have done that, these wonderful volunteers and scientists uh, across the globe. Uh, but I wanted to come back to Marsha and really, um, uh, she may have a filter, she can't show that she's embarrassed, but I want to uh, really highlight Marsha as an example for um, turning that community science interest into action and just an example of how um, I really respect Marsha, how she's um, come to uh, educational opportunities. She's learned a lot about pollinators, but also turned to her own backyard, to her wider community with pollinator projects uh, there at home. She's part of a club that brings in uh, pollinator speakers and has native plant sales. And so just a, um, a really wonderful example of how to turn that interest into uh, real action on the ground. And I know for me, uh, one of the benefits of having this webinar series is being able to talk with so many of you who are participants through email, telling me about your experiences, writing newsletters and conducting educational programs. And, you know, this kind of action is happening um, across the country and across the globe. And I really think it's key to pollinator conservation. So thanks, Marsha. Thanks, all of you, for what you're doing. And um, thanks, Matthew, for, for your work with the Xerces Society, the largest um, insect conservation uh, group uh, in, in, in the country across the globe and actually doing a lot of on the ground projects. Matthew's been with Xerces for uh, about 20 years. And I posted on our uh, short course webpage a link to his recent blog post, which is just a really nice read. I invite you to go uh, after we're done and take a look at that. It's kind of Matthew's reflections on 20 years in pollinator conservation, how his work has changed. Uh, I, I think back to the, uh, you know, one of my favorite texts um, that we've used for a lot of our volunteer trainings, the attractive, attracting native pollinators from Xerces that uh, Matthew was co-author on, um, just really wonderful resources and um, information coming out of Xerces and a lot of that um, coming, coming through Matthew. So Matthew Shepard, the Director of Outreach and Education at Xerces. Um, thanks so much for being with us this morning, Matthew, and uh, uh, walking us through um, some great case studies in action, what people are doing, turning from community science and really taking action on the ground. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and like, I don't know how many of your or, or, or the participants today are from the West Coast, but I'm in California at the moment, so I'm, I'm up as early as everybody else on the West Coast. And I, I don't know how many of the folks here tried to sit up and watch the um, eclipse last night. I was very tempted, but I was like, oh, I have to be early. So I, um, I also, it's cloudy, so I'm not quite sure how much we would have seen. But if you did sit up and watch the eclipse, I hope it was a good one. Um, so yeah, so thanks so much, um, Denise, for that, that kind introduction. Um, as you said, yeah, I've been involved with pollinator conservation for the last couple of decades, and in that time, I've I've seen this incredible transformation. Um, from once upon a time, we would be, I mean, you'd go to an event, and uh, you know, people were like, "Oh, it's the, it's the guy, it's the bee guy," and they would like shuffle away and try and avoid you. Um, but now, I mean, how many people are here? Is it five hundred or more people? Um, listening in this morning and just to see that incredible growth in enthusiasm and dedication and motivation towards protecting insects that for many people are you know they're just pesty things um, stuff to be swatted um, and so I just find it so gratifying and inspiring to um, to see the the, the the incredible work that's being done by so many people um, 
Diversity Society, we have a number of community science programs that we manage, um, some of which we do just on our own, and but most of them are done with, with partners. And so we have Bumblebee Watch is one that now covers um, America and Canada and with several different partners. And we have a series of regional Bumblebee atlases that are growing now. We have the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count. We have um, Milkweed monitoring and mapping projects and I, from what from what i've heard we're close to launching um a firefight community science project as well which will be really cool um, and we do that because the community scientists create and, and, and gather an incredible amount of valuable delta data um, which helps inform our work helps inform our decisions on where to focus conservation effort um, where the best place is to, to dedicate the funds that we have. Um, some of the, the better high profile examples of success that have come from community science um, include the, the listing of the rusty patch bumblebee, um, the first bee in the continental United States to be added to the Endangered Species Act list. Um, the data that supported that was able to demonstrate the decline in that came from community scientists in large part. Um, we, but we, we also do community science because we recognize that community scientists become advocates. They, very few community scientists limit themselves to just gathering the observations. Um, once you see what's there and you realize, maybe you realize what's not there. Um, and then people become very powerful advocates in their, in their neighborhoods, in their hometowns. Um, states, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I, yeah, so um, I was asked to come here and kind of uh, kind of wrap up the, um, the B course, which is quite an honor, um, provide some suggestions, some ideas, some next steps that, that you might be able to get into or want to get into. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen um, and launch my, my presentation. Um, technology, here we go. There we are. So as I say, uh, the community scientists, once you, you get to learn what's there, you get to love what's there. When, when you love it, then you want to take action and protection. Those three steps of learning, loving, acting have been the foundation for so much environmental education work and um, other outreach work done by many, many people over, over decades. Um, and so I wanted to try and um, provide you with some ideas and suggestions on things that you can, can do. Um, Denise has already given a pretty good introduction to the Xerces Society, so there's probably not much more that I need to say, but we are an environmental organization. Um, we're actually celebrating our 50th year um, this year, we were founded by Robert Michael Pyle back in 1971. Um, Bob Pyle is a well-known author, um, lepidopterist, butterfly enthusiast, advocate. Um, and he was in Britain at the time, and he attended a lecture about a butterfly, the large blue, that, it, that back then was just on the cusp of going extinct in Britain. Um, and he came, came back from that. Um, that lecture and he was like, wow, you know, in, in the United States, we've already lost a butterfly, a blue butterfly. Um, and he felt that, that that was a good symbol and a good reason. It was about the time that there was an organization that was standing up and speaking out on behalf of butterflies. And so fairly soon after that, they realized that they really needed to expand beyond butterflies because there are so many other insects and invertebrates they needed. Um, conservation attention. And so from those small origins, um, Xerces has now become established and, and grown, and we are the, the largest um, in insect invertebrate conservation organization in the United States and, and probably in the world, because even now insects are a relatively unusual um, focus for, for much conservation effort. But we do that through um, hands-on conservation we don't own land. We're not like the Nature Conservancy or any or other organizations. And so all the, all the on the ground conservation work we do is in with partnership and collaboration from other people, whether that's a farmer or a gardener or a park manager or a, you know, a, 
a, a wildlife refuge manager. Um, we also do advocacy because although we realize that changing conditions on the ground is the most important thing that we can do. There are times when we have to stand up and say, actually, that's not what you should be doing, or here's a different way of doing it. So we, we um, are active in advocacy for protecting endangered species, for changing pesticide rules and this kind of stuff. We're also involved in research. We are um, a science-based organization. Um, so everything we do, all of our um, suggestions, all of our advocacy is all based upon at the best, best evidence available. Um, um, we are involved with surveys for rare species. We do um, projects to like things like what's the best way to do organic site preparation for seeding for pollinator habitat you know so we we've, we've done studies to figure out that kind of stuff and then we also do a lot of education that can be anything from um giving talks to workshops um we're, we're not doing any in person but we're really hopeful that we'll get back to that um hopefully next year we'll be going out and about um, and then we also you know produce uh, publications and other information materials. Um, although we are much larger than we used to be, um, we now have around 60 staff, but that's still a very small um, group of people to, to do the work. And so we're, we're much bigger than that. We, are, we have 13,000 plus members um, scattered around the world. We, we get support from fat private foundations. We have scientists um, in um, uh, agencies and also in universities and other research institutions who are the ones who keep us scientifically honest. Um, we work with, with companies, um, some of whom are providing funding for our projects and some of whom have become partners with us. So a lot of our, um, the supporting businesses are involved with agriculture, for example. Um, and so they, we, that gives us access to changing the land management on hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland. Um, we partner with um, state, federal, local agencies, with farmers, landowners, you know, who, whoever would like to come and work with us, because these are the people that allow us to change conditions on the ground and create and manage habitat. And then we also um, partner with many, many people who, just like yourself, are doing whatever you can in your local area. And all of that adds up to a huge impact. Looking specifically at pollinators, um, we have what we call the Bring Back the Pollinators campaign. Um, and this is based upon four principles of growing pollinator-friendly flowers, providing the nests and egg laying sites, um, avoiding using pesticides and sharing the word. And these principles can be adapted to any location, um, whether it's uh, you know, a postage stamp size front yard or you know, a thousand acres of farmland, anything in between. With, if you can follow those, those four principles broken down to the most basic level, um, then you can have a real impact. And so these are the four principles that um, a lot of what I, what I do revolves around these um, and the way I've kind of shaped my presentation this morning. I'm also kind of following those four principles, um, but most of it is about that fourth one, share the word. So moving beyond community science, and I'm sure many of you have already done this or are in the process of doing this, but the most important thing is to create pollinator habitat. Because if we can't create habitat, if we don't have the habitat, then we're not gonna have the pollinators and it doesn't really matter what else we do beyond that. Um, so wherever you are, you need to be providing um, habitat that can support the entire life cycle of the bees, secure nest sites, flowering, foraging, and pesticide free. And you can do this anywhere you like, you know, it can be in your, your home garden, like the last slide, it can be in a community garden, a shared garden space, um, business landscaping, college campuses, there's plenty of places where you can bring pollinator habitat into formal landscaping situations, uh, school gardens, there's all sorts of 
spaces where you can be doing that as well as providing educational opportunities, roadsides, you know, farmland, it, it goes on. I mean, I could just sit here and click through photo after photo to give you examples of, of habitats that have been created in so many different places. Um, but if we don't do that, then, then we're not gonna have anything much in our landscape. And if we all do a little bit, then together we can transform our landscapes and bring the diversity back into our landscapes. Um, you can also do it as a community event. Um, volunteering is another great way of um, getting involved with pollinator conservation, either as a volunteer going out and finding another organization to help, um, or you can start organizing it yourself. Um, small groups of people can be incredibly impactful. Um, and often it seems like it's only one small patch, but one small patch where there was nothing can be really a huge um, and significant improvement. So those four, those four bring back the pollinators principles, you know, those examples of habitats, um, encouraging you to go out and make sure that you're doing the gardening. You know, those, those cover the first three of flowers, nest sites and, and pesticides. And I'm not really gonna linger on that any longer. Um, Denise asked me to talk about advocacy and advocacy is in the broadest sense, talking to people, providing information, trying to change minds and gain um, support for what they're doing. And there are lots and lots of little ways in which you can do that. People often think of advocacy as um, kind of standing up, demanding things, arguing things. Um, and, you know, sure, there's some of that, but most of what you can do doesn't involve that. Um, and so I've broken this up into these four kind of categories of, of signs, of, you know, more active advocacy of events, and then also the digital realm that's becoming so important to us these days. Once you've got your habitat, it's a really simple thing to add a sign to the habitat. It tells people what you're doing and why, and it can encourage them to also do something similar. And sometimes it doesn't just encourage them. Sometimes it just gives them the confidence that what they want to do is okay. Um, I know there are a lot of people around who don't like seeing anything more than short grass. Um, and so to transform that into something that looks a little more untidy can be challenging to many people. Um, so adding a sign um, or talking to your neighbors is a really good thing. You obviously you can, you can get signs that are, are produced by other organizations, but signs do not have to be fancy. Signs can be anything you like. Um, you can um, make them yourself, you can buy them. Some people have um, greater artistic talent than, than I do and can come up with really nice fancy ones. Um, but there's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's whatever works for you, whatever um, allows you to put your message out there. Um, you can use them to provide information about what people are seeing. And again, it can be super fancy, high-end professionally produced interpretive signs, or it can be a hand drawn and colored. Again, there's no right or wrong way. Um, you can use these signs to tell people about what's being done. Um, one on the left there is, is great because, you know, this is a site in, um, in one of the, the Bee City affiliates and, you know, they took grass and they're creating habitat. And so for that site to have gone from green grass to a bare patch, it's a challenge to some people um, and other people want to know what's going on. So that sign is very simple, but just explains what they're doing. And another example of a very simple sign, it just pinned on a garden fence and it tells folks that this is a pollinator garden. You can also use signs to give instructions on what not to do. Um, there's one there where they're trying to stop people from mowing things to give a chance for the flowers to grow through. And the other one is uh, um, no spray in this area. So again, your signs can be hand-drawn and simple or can be fancy and professionally produced, but there's really no right or wrong way of doing it. And it doesn't even have to be a sign. You can get into garden art, you can get into um, you know, there's an example of a hand painted rock and then the other one there's a, a, a flower sculpture with a bee on top of it. Um, 
again, it's whatever you want to do and whatever suits the location. Um, but it's just a way to get that message across. It's a very passive way of getting the message across. Um, you know, it, some people um, are nervous about engaging in conversation. And I understand that. I mean, these days we've seen so many examples of um, you know, conversations turning into arguments um, and you know, people just getting elevated emotions around issues that, that shouldn't be so emotive. Um, so signs are a very good way of presenting information, a very um, nice, easy step in sharing the word and um, getting involved with advocacy. If you want to get more active, letter writing, this seems like the, one of the oldest of the, um, the methods, but it's still an incredibly powerful way of doing it. If you were to talk to politicians, it, it's interesting, you know, they say that it doesn't take them, to, they don't have to get many letters on one topic to realize that it's important to their constituents. Sometimes it's as few as 10 letters on, on one topic will raise it up in, in um, their level of priorities. And so it still is a very powerful tool. Um, and in my experience, a handwritten letter is an astonishing thing because we almost none of us write by hand these days. Um, a personal typed letter is another good way of doing it. Um, it's too easy these days for um, an organization to set up a page and you just click and click and click and all of a sudden an auto-generated letter is sent in your name to a politician. Those are less impactful individually but collectively are very effective. Um, but a, a handwritten letter, a personal letter to your local politician, your city agency, um, your local nonprofit where you'd like to have see something different or to your homeowners association. These are still very effective tools. And it's great because it gives you an opportunity to lay out your thoughts without you know, being directly um, in a two-way conversation at that time. So it can be a nice way for you to have quiet time to collect your thoughts, gather your information and present it. You can also be a little more public and you can write letters for your local newspaper, your neighborhood newsletter. Um, this can be in the form of articles um, or monthly common columns or an op-ed or even a, you know, a letter to the editor. Um, these are, I, I know at Xerces, we, we get articles in the you know, Washington Post or New York Times, and it says that like um, you know, 50 million people have read this article. And I look at it and I go like, no, they haven't. You know? But if you see a piece in a local paper that's, that says 6,000 or 2,000, the chances are that that many people really have seen it um, in a lot of small um, towns and cities where people are more reliant upon their local media for information. You know that the people are, are reading that um, and then it becomes the subject conversations in the high street diner around breakfast, et cetera, et cetera. And so these may seem like small steps, but they can have a real impact. You can also put up displays, library, community center, city hall, many of those places have displays that are spaces that are available for individuals and local organizations and you know, put a display up in a place like that for a week or two and it'll be seen by thousands of people. And then there's the more direct kind of advocacy, get involved with the local government, join a city or a park advisory group, make sure you participate in public consultations on, on projects, whether that's a park um, expansion or new construction or whatever. I mean, I, I personally, I've been a member of um, the Natural Resources and Trails Advisory Group for my park district. For so I, I, I stepped down a year or so back, but I, I was involved with that advisory group for about a decade. And it, it doesn't seem like much, but, you know, the park district is one of the largest landowners in our local area and has a position as an environmental leader because you know, although we think of the park as being sports fields or swim centers or whatever facilities the majority of the park holdings are 
creek corridors, uh, undeveloped sites, our natural areas. And so by participating, by sitting there, spending you know, three or four hours each month in meetings and, and, and other things related to that, I was able to influence how those sites were managed, um, was able to speak up for, for wildlife. So these are fairly low key ways to really have an impact. And then there's the, what we might think of as a more classic advocacy, you know, get involved with trying to change your council policies, participate in council meetings, get a spot on, you know, sign up for a, a public comment during a meeting and get your voice heard. And it really does have an impact. Another way in which we can all get involved with our local community, um, share the word, share our passion for, for pollinators and conservation is through events. And some of these events um, include things like tabling at a farmer's market, open days, and events organized by other, uh, other organizations. Sometimes these are city run, sometimes these are local nonprofits, festivals, um, all sorts of things that you can you can claim the space, have a table, just spend time talking to people. One on one conversation is still a very effective and powerful medium. Garden tours, you know, when when you when you all have that fabulous pollinator garden, open it up, show it to people. Um, garden tours are sometimes organized by neighborhoods, sometimes organized by organizations, garden clubs. Um, and, and that, that kind of group. Um, sometimes they're for charity, you know, people will pay their $25 or whatever it is to get a, access to going into all the gardens. And so sometimes you can be bringing benefits to other organizations. But again, it's just showing people what you do, giving them inspiration, letting them see that it's not that hard or not that complicated um, to, to make the first steps towards transforming their yards. Plant sales, many organizations are um, having plant sales these days, garden clubs, um, nature centers, nonprofits. And you can focus these on native plants. You can also focus on pollinators. And so it's a good way of making sure that the, the best plants for the local pollinators get into the hands of gardeners. Celebrations, parades, festivals, there, there are fun ways to spend, to, to spend your time getting the message across. Dress up, make a fool of yourself maybe, but it all, it, it all, it all has an impact. And then there's also walks and talks. Um, you, know, you might lead a, a small group around a, a local nature, nature area to explain what's being done for bees or to just introduce people to bees. You might lead people on, on garden tours to tell them um, which flowers are best at different times of year, or you might participate in, you know, radio shows. I'm not quite sure that photograph on the right there comes from um, from Ridgewood, um, which is a city affiliate. I'm not sure what that event is, and I don't know how many opportunities there are to sit on a stage and have a conversation. Um, but there may well be opportunities like that, um, and it's just a conversation, so it's not a not a scary thing to do. These days, social media, websites, digital are becoming increasingly important. And so there are lots of ways in which we can all do that, either through our personal social media, um, either we share with our friends, or I know some people have more than one social media account. And so they use one for sharing photos of their, their kids and grandkids and family, et cetera, and keep that very personal. And then they have another one that they use for promoting um, pollinated conservation and, and their other, other passions. Um, many organizations have um, social media. And so, you know, garden clubs, local groups, B-City affiliates, et cetera, have social media. And it's a very good way, an effective way of getting information out and um, having a conversation. It's, it's one of the few two-way um, channels that we have for electronic. Webinars. It's, uh, it's a pandemic thing. You know, two years ago, we weren't spending so much time in front of a screen. We, many of us didn't even really know what Zoom was. Um, but it's, it's become an incredibly valuable way 
to, to share the word um, and to talk about issues. Um, I mean, it's like here, I, what, 500 plus people from I don't know how many states and countries, and I'm just sitting in my mother-in-law's house um, talking to you all. And it really, one of the, the biggest advantages of it is it breaks down the barriers, the geographic barriers of access. And so it allows people who otherwise would not be able to participate to join in. You can also set up your own website, whether that's a personal website or for your, your local organization. Um, provide information, write blogs and articles. You know, it's a, it's a great way of presenting information that's accessible to anybody at any time. Um, apps these days, um, the, the, the advent of smartphones and mobile technology is beginning to transform everything. There are an increasing number of um, organizations who are setting up apps. Um, and it, it's a much more interactive. People are using these as challenge apps saying like, hey, you know, go around the, this, the, go around our town, see if you can find all these different species or just information um, for people. So there are other ways of getting information into people's hands through electronics. And then videos. Videos is a really good way of storytelling. Um, you can capture tales of what gardeners are doing. You can capture stories and examples of what local groups are doing. Um, and this photograph shows expensive equipment, big floodlights, et cetera, et cetera. But all you need is a smartphone. And you don't need more than that to be able to get involved with, with storytelling like this. I've mentioned B-City USA a few times, and if you've been looking at the um, photo credits, you'll have seen that many of them came from B-City USA affiliates and also B-Campus USA affiliates. I wanted to flag this because, you know, well, there's so much that we can do individually and we should be doing individually um, because one person really can have an impact in, in, in helping to change the landscape and bringing in the diversity that we need to support bees. Um, but there may also be uh, opportunities for taking it community-wide. And um, Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA um, provide a framework for you to do that. Um, it, the, the, the program has requirements you know, the, the affiliates must do certain things in order to retain their certification. Um, and the requirements are essentially the same as to bring back the pollinators of you know, plants, nests, the, um, avoid pesticides and share the word, do outreach and education. Um, but it requires an, a formal commitment within the city program, it requires a resolution from the city council. Within the campus program, it requires a resolution from um, the, the top levels of admin within the campus. Um, but it allows you to draw together the whole community. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna give you some slightly longer examples um, just to wrap up this morning on what some of the affiliates have done and one of them Actually, uh, I, it's, it, 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 yeah, anyway, it's inspiring to see how pollinators have become a focal point for rebuilding their, their community. So, B City USA, B Campus USA, um, if you would like to take pollinated conservation to the community level um, and be part of a network of, of affiliates that is now nearly 280 affiliates across the country, um, go to bcityusa.org and you'll find lots of information. So a few, three slightly longer examples of things that people have done. Um, no Mo May, it's an initiative that started in, in Britain with an organization called Plant Life. Um, the very simple idea um, is that manicured lawns provides little or no benefit. Um, and by bringing some flowering diversity back into these lawns, um, you can at least bring some benefit to pollinators. It's been said, that, and, and the, the figures suggest that this is true, that 
grass lawns are the largest crop by acreage in the USA. And a manicured lawn, that um, stereotypical image that so many people seem to be in pursuit of with their gardens um, of Im immaculate, unblemished greenery um, is terrible, terrible for wildlife. As I was saying, No Mo May is an initiative first promoted by plant life in Britain. Um, and by not mowing early in the year, it allows the grass to grow and the flowers within that lawn to blossom and it provides some forage to bees. Um, these areas are, are great, but it is a lot of it is, um, is weeds. And it, that's why it's interesting the fact that in Britain, there are still areas that have you know, centuries old grasslands that are now mown and run as a lawns and have these incredible wildflowers growing them. Um, and so I, I realize that that's why no Mo May began in Britain because of those, those incredible old lawns. Um, but even the, the weeds that typically come through in many um, are beneficial. No Mo May, our involvement in No Mo May at, at Xerxes came through the B-City program um, and largely thanks to the efforts of the B-City committee in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, they, they thought No Mo May was such a great idea and they wanted to let, the, let um, the grass grow. And they realized that the first thing they had to do was to um, get the city weed ordinances because there are rules and regulations about how long the grass can grow. And they knew that they needed to get those, um, those rules overturned or at least um, waived temporarily to allow members, uh, homeowners to grow the grass. And this was quite a big argument. They had to go at least twice to the city council to argue the case. The first vote um, was not in favor of no Mome. They went back and they, they had a second vote um, and they, they got the council to um, agree to waiving the, the rules back uh, last year. Um, there was a lot of resistance. The, the park managers didn't like the idea of having longer grass around. Many of the residents are um, fans of, of short grass and have an artificial image of what a tidy garden should look like. But last year, more than 400 homeowners participated in No Mo May that one year. And the other great thing is that the B-City Committee um, was able to partner with researchers at Lawrence University, a local university in, in that corner of Wisconsin. Um, which was also a B Campus USA affiliate. So it was this great partnership and synergy between the two. And um, uh, led by um, Professor Israel de Toro at Lawrence University, a group of um, researchers studied the number of bee species and the abundance of bees in the unknown lawns that were growing and also in um, mode areas uh, nearby, and it was striking. They found that the, the abundance of, oh, sorry, the number of different bee species, the um, diversity of bees was three times higher in unmown grass than it was in mown grass. And the abundance of bees in those lawns was five times higher than it was in the, uh, in the mown lawns. And that's, that's striking, and that's a benefit that comes from doing nothing, essentially. Um, and so this year, No Mo May successfully returned. Um, but again, they had to go and get that um, council to waive the mowing requirements. Um, and they tried to get the council to let them to mow, you know, let, let the grass grow into June, but the council wouldn't, wouldn't ex um, accept that. But the success of that first year um, there are, I think it's half a dozen or maybe eight cities that are really close together in the Fox Valley there. Um, and more of those cities have now joined in and are participating in No Mo May. So that, that's one example of a small group of, of motivated, keen people, perseverance, um, advocacy. And in this case, they had that partnership with the um, the researchers at Lawrence University. 
and it's become this ever-growing event and we're assuming it will come back next year and maybe they'll be able to um, extend it into June. And so this year we also, following the success of um, Appleton in, in 2020, the Peace City Network started promoting Nomo May to its wider network of cities and campuses. Um, and a number of those picked it up and a number are planning to, to do it next year because they have to go through all of these administrative and regulatory layers in order to get um, a situation where it, it's so simple. A homeowner just wants to let their grass grow. Now, Nomo May is great. And I said at the beginning of this um, little segment that it is bringing more bees um, in and it is bringing more flowers into the landscape, but it really isn't the be all and end all. I mean, just because you have um, Dutch clover and dandelions and such like growing in your lawn, that's, that's better than nothing, but it's still not super quality habitat. Um, and so, no Mome is just one step forward. It's one of those incremental steps that allow us to bring more flowers back into our landscapes and begin to make our neighborhoods less inhospitable. But you really want to be moving more towards planting a meadow, having flowers, um, native plants. Um, but that said, no Mome has been a really effective um, way to to boost the bee populations in these towns and, and also has become a great way to build a community of um, pollinator enthusiasts. Moving from Wisconsin to Georgia, um, the, the city of Decatur um, is another Bee City USA affiliate and they have been doing some great work on promoting um, habitat and you know, awareness of pollinators. But this group realized that mosquito spraying um, was becoming more prevalent. An increasing number of homeowners were hiring companies to come around and uh, fog their backyards, spray their backyards um, to try and control mosquitoes. And this was having an impact on everything else out there. And so Decatur took on mosquito spraying as a core um, campaign for their B City affiliate. They created these pretty effective lawn signs um, that, that go up in, in gardens and, and raise um, awareness. They are also going out and taking their, their message of mosquito spraying being bad out to farmers markets, to fall festivals, to you know, all sorts of different events and activities. Um, they also took it to their social media and created um, social media graphics to share the, the message um, and encourage more people to avoid spraying. Um, they were sensible enough, they realized that you can't just say, don't do something. You also need to be offering guidance and advice on what you can do and what you should be doing as an alternative. And so they created these um, effective graphics there um, the one on the, the left is showing you the kinds of places where mosquitoes are actually gathering. Because if you were to look into this, mosquitoes are not um, on all your plants and trees and everywhere else. Mosquitoes, the key places to um, treat for mosquitoes are any places where small quantities of water are gathering, and whether that's your pet dish or a, um, a wading pool that you don't empty out or a blocked gutter that's got a small puddle in it. Those are little places where mosquitoes are breeding and causing the problems. And so treat those. And then also another graphic on the simple things that you can do to protect yourself. So it becomes um, a personal, um, protecting yourself from mosquitoes becomes a series of individual steps that you can take um, rather than trying to blitz the environment. And Decatur also met with their environmental committee within the council and did lots of other um, advocacy type activities. Um, but these lawn signs, tabling, social media and um, uh, information materials were the core of their effort. And then my last example, um, the one that I find, I, I, 
this strikes home to me because it's from Oregon. Um, last September of yeah, 2019, I guess it was, although I, I'm thinking maybe, but anyway, Oregon has been hit by horrendous fires like so much else of um, other states on, on the West Coast. I know California was burning, Southern Oregon was burning this last summer. Um, but this, this, the city of Talent, which is a B city affiliate, um, in September, a fire sparked and it roared through Talent and Phoenix and Gold Hill and into the southern part of Medford. And more than 2,600 homes and businesses were destroyed in that one fire. It was, it was the worst um, loss of property um, structures, urban fires in recorded history for Oregon. And along with those fires, gardens, parks, green spaces also burnt. And so, you know, this was devastating for the community. But since then, pollinator conservation um, has become a, a, a central focal point for the community. They've been able to rally around, to get together. Um, the connections that were made with garden clubs and native plant societies and other organizations and businesses have not only allowed them to begin to rebuild some of these habitats, but also have provided community connections that have allowed people who didn't know each other to come together and support each other in, in rebuilding, um, you know, in the physical sense of rebuilding structures that were lost, but also in, in rebuilding the community that inevitably, you know, you lose that many houses and people scatter, you know, and so your neighbors are no longer your neighbors, they're now somewhere else. Even within the B-City committee, you know, one of the people who had been um, central to the, the the committee for years moved to Washington State and so everything had to rebuild but pollinators provided um, a focal point for that and it really is just astonishing what they've managed to do and continue to do on the day of the Alameda fire starting the committee had met to certify their 59th pollinator garden within the, within the town, the city of Talent. And then this spring, they certified number 60. And so they're continuing to expand and continuing to grow. Um, and I just find that such an incredible um, story of what they've managed to do down there in the face of such tragic and devastating loss. So just very quickly, just to wrap up, um, I don't have any more examples or suggestions on, on what you can do. I'll, I'll be happy to, to take questions and, and stay um, as, as, I try and stay as long as answer any question that gets thrown in my direction. Um, but just quick, I want to wrap up with a few suggestions. So, you know, places you can go to look for information. Um, Xerxes Society has, has books which you may well have encountered. We also, if you go to our website, which is xerces.org, xerces.org, you'll find dozens, hundreds of um, fact sheets, conservation guides, um, brochures that you can download, print at home, um, take a PDF, send it to your friends, whatever. We also have our YouTube channel where we have webinars and videos and other content that you can, you can watch. We have social media, so you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we share information and have discussions and conversations around um, insect conservation there. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your patience uh, this morning and your time. And also, thank you for the community science you do, for the data you gather, for the work you already do to support pollinator conservation. Um, and if you can step further and start direct action in your neighborhood or your hometown or whatever level feels comfortable to you, that would be amazing. Great, thank you, Matthew. So inspiring examples. I love the talent example of the community coming together around pollinator gardens. Um, it's nice that you have that slide up there with Phil Stiles, right? And uh, Jerry in the chat mentioned um, 
Phil Stiles, who was the originator of, mm -hmm. um, open our panel here, sorry, yeah. um, originator of B-City and B-Campus and worked with uh, Xerxes in the transition until she retired, a really uh, inspiring person with um, a lot of energy and great ideas. Yeah. So um, let's see. So there were a lot of different questions and um, thank you for your willingness to uh, stick around and ask and oh, answer some of those questions. I'm just um, shutting the blind. That's why I'm, I'm listening. Don't worry. Okay, no problem. Yeah, Matthew started out, it was pretty much in the dark and we've watched the nice transition of light fill his <laughs> room there. Um, so there were a lot of thumbs up on a question about roadside habitat and um, mm -hmm. whether that that kind of habitat on a roadside is a danger to um, to pollinators or whether that, that danger is ne negligible. Um, there is some danger to pollinators. Uh, we can't, can't deny that. Um, the, the studies that have been done um, that, that we're aware of indicate that when you have more diversity of flowers on a roadside, you seem to get fewer um, squishes by passing vehicles. And it seems to be that when you have the flowers on the roadside, then the bees and butterflies don't go searching for, for forage. And so they don't move around as much. Um, and so when you put that diversity in, then they don't have to move across the road as frequently. Um, that said, for sure, there is going to be some risk to pollinators. And I know there are, have been some studies that have, that have tried to quantify that. But then you also come down to the fact that there aren't many places in our, in our disturbed landscapes where there is space for habitat now. There are very few safe places in, our, in, in most landscapes, whether it's an urban landscape or an agricultural landscape. And very few safe places for pollinators and not that many areas which are um, available for conversion to meadows, prairies, quarter what you like. And so roadsides do provide a really big opportunity for pollinator conservation, for putting um, habitat into the landscape um, and also for providing connections across landscapes. And then the other thing I would mention on that is I mean, a lot of the photographs and I, and when I was putting that photograph into the presentation, I was like, oh, dang, it's got a, it's got a freeway sign. I'm going to get that question about bugs being squished. Um, but a lot of the work that's being done on roadsides is not on freeways or major roads. It's on rural byways and minor roads. Um, there are so many examples of roadsides that are supporting rare plants or even rare butterflies. You know, I know of one example in, in Oregon where a rare butterfly, one of its largest, most stable populations is on roadsides in a rural area. Um, and so, you know, many of the roadsides that um, are being converted to um, habitat or which still support um, a diversity of plants are, are just, they're not freeways, so it's not high speed traffic trundling past all day. Peter asked kind of a um, associated question about the opportunities for creating pollinator habitat um, under electric uh, grid transmission lines or wind turbines, solar fields kind of as our power uh, uh, you know, as the, the, the world changes, what are some other opportunities for pollinator habitat? Yeah, I mean, there are so many opportunities out there. Um, for sure, power lines, and it happens that we're working with um, power transmission companies to improve habitat on um, the, the easements there. And yet solar, there are, there is a, um, I can't remember the name of the organization now, but there is a one organization that has been promoting um, pollinator friendly solar farms. Um, although for some of that, the idea behind pollinator friendly is putting a beehive on it and putting a beehive on an area doesn't necessarily equal conservation. Um, you know, honeybees are not native and do compete with um, native bees. And um, so, conservation of, of bees focuses on habitat because that's what we need to support our, our native bees and will also support the honeybees around. Um, it, I mean, I could 
give you a laundry list of possible areas that you could put habitat in, including parks and golf courses and um, business campuses, you know, almost anywhere where there is space could be habitat. And there are examples um, from this country for sure, but elsewhere um, of people putting in small patches of habitat in all sorts of places. Rooftops, there's an increasing number of um, green roofs around and often that's considered to be a massive sedum. Um, but there are opportunities to create incredible habitats on roofs. You'd have to get make sure the engineering's there because it's difficult to put a several tons of dirt on top of an existing building. But if you if you can um, engineer it in, you could put a forest on top of the building if you wanted to. Um, and But there are examples of, of roofs where they're not flowering. They call them brown roofs and they're recreating bare riverbanks and um, uh, brownfield type locations. Because although we tend to think of flowers as being habitat, there are so many species that don't need flowers, but need the other elements, need the bare soil. And that's not just bees that nest, but also some birds that you know, only nest on um, bare dirt or sand or rocky conditions. And so, you know, there are all sorts of opportunities from 40 stories up to underneath the power lines um, scattered across our landscapes where we can be putting habitat in. Um, as we round up to the top of the hour, and we'll keep going with questions, Matthew, as long as, as you're able to keep going, but um, uh, can you, uh, before folks hop off here if they need to, uh, how do you contact Xerces to get help on projects in local areas? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It kind of depends on, on your project. Um, if you go to our website, which is xerces.org, x-e-r-c-e-s.org, you'll find the about tab and there's a staff and contacts tab. Um, and then at the top of that page, you'll find a list of different types of different emails. Um, because if you want help with um, pesticides, you should contact our pesticide team. If you want help with habitat on a farm, you should contact our pollinator team and so on. Um, so you can, you can find that list of, of contacts on that page or and you can just contact me and I'll, I'll distribute. And my email address is matthew.shepherd at xerces.org. Great, thank and you. Now I will, I, I, I'll warn you, I already get a lot of emails, so I may not be the quickest responder. So. <laughs> but you I'll may try have, and help you anybody. You have 500 in your email box. I know, I was <laughs> like, oh, should I really? <laughs> Very but no, but, I, I, but I, I, I shared my email knowing, knowing the implications. I just apologize if I'm slow responding. So. Uh, Beth asks, are there non-native plants that have pollen or nectar that are toxic to native bees? Oh, interesting question. Um, there are some plants that are known to have toxic nectar and actually rhododendron is one of the best known of those. Um, and then also actually Tilia, um, the linden trees, they have nectar that can, um, because of the sugars, can be toxic to bumblebees. Um, so those are probably the two, um, well, those are the two that come to my mind at the moment, and there may well be others. Um, the, the rhododendron one has, even back in kind of Greek le legend, um, the nectar from rhododendron was known to be toxic um, and apparently in a, in a high enough quantity to people as well as to insects. Thanks and folks if you do have, have to hop off I see some of you already doing that in the chat box but if you want to give a, um, a thank you to Matthew I know he'd appreciate that if you need to hop off we will keep recording the, um, the questions here for another 10 minutes or so so if you want to come back in. Um, do manufactured bee houses help bees? If so, uh, which ones and how? And I always give our presenters um, latitude. You can answer as much or as little of the question, interpret it how you'd like, because I know every question could be an hour, but. Um. Yeah, of course. Um, the easy answer to that is yes. Um, manufactured bee homes do help. Um, the, the manufactured bee homes, the ones that I, I've encountered, um, they're typically, and when, I, when I'm thinking of manufactured bee homes, I'm thinking of mason bee blocks. Um, you can also buy boxes um, for bumblebees. 
Um, and you know, obviously, you know, a manufactured bee home in the broadest sense could involve uh, or could include a honeybee hive. Um, but I'm I'm going to focus my my response upon upon bee boxes, bee blocks. Um, you know block of wood with lots of holes drilled into it or a bundle of stems. Um, those are, are great. Um, on the whole, all a bee is needing when it's looking for a nest site is opportunity, the right kind of space for it to, to create its brood cells and make its nest. Um, the, the manufactured um, bee blocks are focused on orchard mason bees and um, one, uh, the, uh, a leaf cutter bee, that's actually a, a non-native leaf cutter bee, the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. And those are two species that have been studied and are understood well enough to be able to create the conditions that they like and to be um, managed as a, a reliable pollinator of commercial crops. And they both have very particular hole diameters that they like. In the case of the um, orchard mason bee, it's five sixteenth inch diameter, and so you put one of those up, and mason bees will will love it and will occupy it, and and that's great. The downside of those blocks, um, or only I should say, only relying on those blocks, is that bees are not all the same size, um, as as you know from from your, your own reading and studies, they can be anything from like um, a yellow faced bee that's only you know, an eighth of an inch long, um, all the way up to a, a really large leaf cutter bee that is going to be much larger than a mason bee um, and will need correspondingly a much smaller or a much larger hole. So anything between about 332nd inch diameter and 38 inch diameter. And Manufactured commercially produced blocks don't provide that range of holes. And so putting those blocks up is great and it's a good first step, but you're not providing for the, the, the range of other tunnel nesting bees that, that will be in your garden or your local area. So you need to be providing those smaller and those larger tunnels. And then the other problem with, or the potential problem with commercially um, produced blocks is they have lots of holes. Um, and to really keep that block useful and productive from the perspective of continuing to, to provide good home for future generations of bees, it needs to be kept clean. Um, because when you get that kind of concentration of um, bees, you can end up with an inevitable concentration of parasites, diseases, fungi, and other bad stuff that are not doing your bees any good. Um, and so that's also a problem with the these large, sometimes called bee walls, people put these, and they're, they're fabulous structures. And, you know, but again, you need to look after them, you need to maintain them, because if you're not, in a period of about three years, they're just going to be full of dead stuff and not being very beneficial at all. So, as you, as you said, Denise, I could keep talking, but hopefully that's been a, a, a long enough answer. Thank you. So Brian had a very specific question and a lot of people did a thumbs up on it. So I'm going to kind of, Brian, I hope do justice to your question, kind of um, get the gist of the question and maybe you could present Matthew some options that people have because weed problems are going to be different, but where to go to get advice. Um, so Brian was establishing some wildflower habitat. They prepped the site with herbicides and um, mechanical means according to how it was recommended. Um, they planted with um, the seed mix, um, but many, many weeds came up. Um, they did have some of the desirable plants, but, um, but there were a lot of weeds as well. And so uh, the question kind of is what to do about that kind of newly seeded situation um, with a lot of weed pressure? Will the desirable plants kind of overcome that? Where, where can people turn for more advice on how to, um, you know, how to kind of solve that difficult problem? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, there are growing numbers of people around with that, that kind of knowledge to help. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know what type of land Brian was seeding in or the scale of his project, but for, for many landowners, the, um, uh, the US Department of Ag's Natural Resources Conservation Service is a really good 
place to go for um, answers on these kinds of problems. And I would inevitably, I would also recommend our pollinator staff because this is, this is what they do all the time. And we do have staff um, working with um, landowners, creating habitats, maintaining habitats in many states across the country. I can't guarantee that we can get to all of you, um, but we certainly have, have folks in, in many states and this is, this is what they do every day. Um, I, I just think, yeah, I mean, I've mentioned the NRCS. There's also soil water conservation districts and the resource conservation districts who also um, are working every day with, with, with landowners um, on small scale habitat projects. To respond to the, the kind of broader issue here, um, th this weed pressure is a very well known challenge when when seeding um, the way that we do it is we and, and sounds like Brian did did all that he, he could with um, herbicide and, and mechanical but it can take several applications of herbicide over a couple of years to really suppress the weeds because you you know you kill them off you let them grow you you hit them again you let them grow you hit them again um, but the other thing that it, you do get um, with the seed mixes certainly the seed mixes which our staff, um, create for projects, they try and make sure that there is, um, it's a combination of annuals that will burst through and have some bloom in the first years, and then the longer, longer growing perennials, which take longer to establish. And by doing that, you can create a balance of bloom um, and effectively, you know, pressure from the good plants that help to suppress the weeds. But even then you get a lot of weed pressure coming through um, just because you know, by doing your seed bed, um, you've created this, these perfect conditions for plants to grow. And so you do get a lot of weeds coming through. And it, it does, in the first year, it's not at all unusual for in the first year or two to have a lot of weeds and it can take, you know, you can mow those. Um, it's, spot treat um, pernicious ones, you know, you have thistles or whatever that you can, that need spot treating. Um, but you sometimes it's just patience um, and it can take three or four years of, of care and work until the plants you've seeded in really get established. And then once they're established, they will um, crowd out the weeds. And folks, thanks for putting ideas and links into the chat box. And I will uh, make a point to pull that chat off and um, as a uh, save it as a file on our recording site. But there are um, uh, links to the Xerces uh, bulletin, which I love on organic preparation for um, for seeded sites. Um, a Prairie Moon was mentioned. Um, how to find your local N NRCS um, office and um, other other uh, links there in the chat box. Yes, yes. Since you mentioned the um, organic site prep. I mean that's great before seeding, but if you're if you're already seeding and growing, it's that's harder. Um, but if people look, they'll find that there is a publication called Maintaining Diverse Stands of Wildflowers, and that talks more about the maintenance of um, habitat areas after seeding. Okay, and I'll, I'll bet somebody's already linked that. Uh, they may well pop yeah, that into great. the chat box. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I so say it's it's great having lots of people helping with the answer right. as well. So. <laughs> Okay, so um, so far, last question: um, Do you have any resources that address fear of insects, uh, particularly bees? We don't. I mean, at Xerces, we don't have have resources. I know um, there are one or two fact sheets and brochures that have been produced by other organisations, such as Pollinator Partnership, um, but it's not one that we've got into at Xerces. Um, it is a real concern for for many people, um, and. I, I don't want to dismiss it or or minimize it anyway because I, I'm very aware of the risks um, for for those folks who who truly you know anaphylactic shock you know it really is a life and death situation and so I, I know that this is a um, a major concern but I you know most bees are not aggressive in any way. Um, you know, if you spent time monitoring and observing and taking photographs, you know that they're not going to see you coming and then run out, you know, fly after you and, and chase you down. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it, it comes down to spending time around them. 
you know, they're, they're very gentle insects. Um, they, they're not going to attack you. I mean, if you disturb them, their first thing is gonna be to try and fly away. Um, you know, honeybees are the ones that will eviscerate themselves and die after they sting you. Um, but most other, you know, other bees don't have a barbed stinger. And so if they really wanted to, they could sting you several times, um, but they don't. They, they just don't, because I mean, biologically, it takes a really big commitment of their bodily resources to create that venom. And so they don't want to waste that. Um, and so they are very gentle and they, they will flee rather than fight. Um, and if you've spent time around bumblebees, for example, the, the, their first reaction is actually to wave their middle legs at you, which is, you know, it's a little unexpected. And if you're not, not ex anticipating, it is kind of a threatening thing. You're like, well, what's going on? All of a sudden their back legs or their middle legs are like waving around behind them. Um, and that's just their first, first response is just kind of to warn you. Um, and so, yeah, there is a risk and there is some nervousness around, around bees, but if you spend time around them, and you spend time with other people around them, then other people will get will be grow in confidence and comfort. Great. Thank you, Matthew, for a really wonderful presentation. I want to thank you for your time and your expertise and uh, for joining us super early. Um, also, our participants, too, everybody, thanks for, for coming in. Really have enjoyed the series. I hope you did. You'll get a link to the uh, evaluation as you leave, and I love your input. Uh, we really look to your thoughts and ideas for how we can improve. So, uh, again, thanks, Marcia. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, everybody, have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Bye.